Welcome to Familiar Territory, an anime podcast hosted by two white dudes who've been friends for over 15 years. Here we talk about the history and influence of anime, as well as review anime new and old. So grab your talking cap and transform into some comfy clothes as we step into a familiar territory. My name is Grant. And I'm Brantley. Heads up, spoilers on the way. Check the description, see if you're safe to listen. Listen to my song. That's info gear. <laughs> ah, shit. It's the wrong musical anime. Brantley, what did we watch? Shoujo Kagaki Review Starlight, the movie. Fuck. Y- yes, we did. Yeah. So, a series that we already really liked had a movie. We watched it. Um. And you can guess how we <laughs> felt about this movie. Based it on fucking that. sucked. No! <laughs> <laughs> no, stay here. Stay here. If you like Review Starlight, I promise we liked it. Um, oh, it was incredible. It was, it was very good. Um, There was something I was going to say about it. Yeah. Before you cut me off. Unceremoniously disrupted your non sequitur. <laughs> ah, that's all right. So we watched the Review Starlight movie. It was very late. We watched it. It was one of the first things that we watched together in the same room that we reviewed for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty exciting to have the emotional uh, capacity to cry in front of your homies as you uh, watched theater girls try and stab each other. Mm -hmm. But it was hella good. I personally was really, really worried it was going to suck and by suck, I mean be very mediocre. Mm-hmm. I kind of looked at the ending of the TV show to be nearly flawless. Mm-hmm. And I did not know how they would top themselves. But, boy oh boy, did they did they, did they they do it. Yeah, this, this movie is almost, to me, it's like a gigantic epilogue. Like, yeah. you have the series, and it's like if they, if they took the ending credits of, like, you know, oh, so and so went on to do this. Oh, so and so went on to do that. And they're like, well, what if we took like one incredibly small part of life that happens before that happens, and we just blow it into a two-hour-long movie spectacle, um, and that's it, right? Like, in terms of like what gets covered, it's a really small scope, but they don't waste a moment, and it's still like a really dense movie um if you liked review starlight at all you're gonna like this it feels very close to the actual show like the the production value is like it's movie quality but like the original series already had some very stunning moments so like it's not like an amazing leap away from what you're already used to it feels like they they took sort of the most compact parts of the tv show and then they just did that for two hours right and that's great for us yeah it's pretty damn good um oh this is also it's not non-canon it's not a side story this is just it's sequel material so yeah it is it is like the end of a 90s college film where it tells you what everyone did after the big old party and uh goofing on the dean (laughs) and uh, except for theater girls with swords yeah uh Let's let's get into the the meat of it. So, it takes place like two years after the original moot show. It takes place their senior year, and they were sophomores in the first one. Yeah, I think so. But I think Japanese high school might might be three years total. Oh, okay. So, so it's it's their third year, but it's the end of their third year. Yeah, and they're they're deciding on where they want to go to college. So you have uh. You know, you, you have, like, Futaba and Maya and Mahiru who want to all go to the the London theater troupe. You have Maya, I mean, Claudine, who wants to do, like, a French troupe. Uh, Karuko wants to continue doing, like, traditional Japanese stuff. Uh, Dai Banana wants to go into directing. Karin doesn't know what she wants to do. Uh, and uh, Hikari disappeared. So she's gone. Uh, also, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Rebu Starlight, we're gonna spoil the shit out of Rebu Starlight yeah. and Rebu Starlight the movie. Uh, so you can either go watch our original 
review over Revu Starlight if you want to know kind of the synopsis and our original ideas over the show. Or you can actually watch the show because it's fucking good. Go watch it. Yeah. Um, so so it kind of starts with their their end goals. Um, and everyone, it, it's really interesting. One of my favorite parts is how Karuko is because Karuko is the the sleepy girl from the first one who's Futaba's friend in <laughs> very large quotation marks. Wow, God, he was. Um, and she didn't really have too much of a characterization in the first one. She was just. You know, the girl that Futaba looked up to, or the girl that Futaba protected. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in this one, she's the first person to basically say, hey, we aren't fighting each other anymore. That's kind of fucked. (laughs) And it kind of leads into this whole thought process of, are we still in the running to be the top star, or did we lose our passion for it? And are we just regularly, regular theater kids? And... It's an interesting dynamic because everyone seems to miss it. There, There's not as much drama between the characters at this point. Everyone's kind of friends and understands. Like, that part still carries over from the first series where they're still rivals, but they don't hate each they, they, There's less drama. They never hated each other in the original one, but there wasn't this competitive edge that was, that was kind of running through the, the crew. So... They they're going on a school field trip to visit the oh shit what is the troop name they're the big old Shakespeare troop in England they're very famous uh, I don't remember it doesn't matter so but it's important because they they go to it right and it's and a national thing right that they're go- they're applying for. yeah yeah and and Karin is is sad because to her she did her thing she wanted to do starlight with hikari and she did that and now she's alone because mm-hmm. hikari's gone and hikari left because she thought that if she was with karin karin wouldn't reach her potential and there is this this kind of over looming threat that karin will never experience that theater again sort of like how hikari felt that in the original series there's mm-hmm. this nice parallelism between the two yeah so, as they as they do the, prepare to go on this 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 trip this uh, field trip, they are on a train, and if you've ever seen the battle train from Pokemon Black and White, it becomes that they all get their weapons, they all get their their outfits, and Die Banana is like we have to fight one last time. And Dai Banana absolutely kicks everyone's ass. Just, like, not even a contest. But not Karin. But not Karin, because Karin isn't one. there. Yeah. Because they separate the train. Very, and, and once again, it kind of plays this weird line between what's real and what's metaphorical. Because mm-hmm. Karin definitely disappears <laughs> for, like, a, the entire movie. Yeah. And then they go back to their school without Karin. Karin's gone. And no one is no one's worried that she's missing, and you find out that the the underclassmen are doing Starlight again, and it kind of revitalizes them. And you realize that Die Banana wasn't saying, "Hey, I'm still better than you." She was saying, "We all still have our 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 spark, but what other sparks do we need?" And so they basically redo auditions again, where they have to fight each other one more time to prove to themselves that they are doing what they want to do because they like it. So I don't want to jump to themes too quickly, but to me, Revu Starlight the movie is about doing your passion because it is your passion, while Revu Starlight is doing your passion with the help and assistance of your friends. So they they work together, right? You You want to be able to collaborate when you do these theatrical performances, but you still need to have that, that personal, almost... I don't want to say selfish, but that ambitious self-reliance that they the, the girls have. Because you have a lot of them are splitting up. You have mm-hmm. uh, Futaba, who wants to go to the World Theater, despite the fact that she considers herself kind of a weak actor. Uh, June wants to continue uh, working for her schooling and understand it on a technical level. Um, because she feels that she isn't uh, like good enough. And, of course, you have the Maya Claudine, where Maya never actually lived up to... Or, uh, Claudine never lived up to Maya's uh, 
Maya's equal. She was never her equal. Uh, it's really, really good. And we'll talk a little bit about the fights um, as I as I finish this up. So so the entire purpose is that Hikari also gets brought into it. Um, and, and the entire, the fights happen and Karin ends up fighting Hikari. And the the entire purpose is to say Karin needs to let go of Hikari and she needs to do her own thing because there is the next stage. And that's kind of like the, the overrunning themes is that the next stage is going to happen, whether you're with your friends or not. And boy, oh boy, is it sad. Yeah, it's it's very much, it's about separation. Um, and it's about sort of, you know, dealing with that, but also not losing out on everything they had sort of built collaboratively before. Um, it It's sort of, it's blurring the line between sort of competition and cooperation more closely than than I think maybe the original series did, where the original series ended on a pretty decisive note about like, hey, as actors, we all come together and we make this experience happen, regardless of who's kind of, you know, the, you know, the star of the show, everybody needs to be like you know essentially at the top of their game to make it work regardless of what your part is um and that's still here but it's it's more so like grappling with the fact that like all right you know high school's over and we don't have our regular sort of excuses or context to keep together anymore some of us want to go away Others want to stick together, and we're going to have to deal with it anyways. What is this feeling, right? And how do we not lose ourselves in it? Um, I don't want to say that it's an like individualist movie. Um, it, it's not. In, yeah. But... It, instead, it's it's more about sort of like embracing the the times you've had with other people, and like Grant said, like not losing the spark, right? Um, and I, I'd say then leaping a little bit off of that, um, becoming comfortable with, um, you know, separation or failure or success and separation, you know, whatever that might be. Um, it's, you know, their first big exposure with that. Um, and so, you know, at least sort of in their more like socially cognizant parts of their lives, um, and that's I think where things kind of come to a head. So, yeah. Shall we? Yeah. Shall we make like this movie and do a bit of backtracking now? Because the yeah, abs- this, this movie kind of alternates between those like dream sequences uh, and these like um, flashbacks. You know, there there's almost very little that happens like moving forward in the movie. Um, a, a lot of it is like sort of in like visual metaphor dream zone. And then there's a lot of it that's strictly like flashbacks. There's a lot about Karen and uh, Hikari um, to sort of like take what we already knew about their childhood friendship and their relationship and sort of complexify it and deepen it. Um, so yeah, let's let's kind of like I don't know, skip around, roll it back, do whatever we need to do to sort of elaborate our our feelings on this. Yeah, well, one of the things I really liked is seeing Karin and Hikari's relationship prior to them meeting back at the school. Mm-hmm. There was something, it, it filled in something that was missing from the original show, and that was Hikari and Karin's relationship before they left. Um, and we know that they didn't know each other for very long, but they were important to each other. And we got to see why they were important to each other, but we didn't get to see the aftermath from it. Because we see that they went and saw Starlight together, They bought each other hairpins, and then they didn't see each other for literally 10 years, Mm -hmm. right? I loved seeing how Karin continued to work on herself and become a better actor and a better theater person because of Hikari's influence. I loved seeing her do her plays when she was in middle school. I liked seeing her do her voice lessons. I liked seeing her talk about how she she wanted to fulfill the promise not to talk to Hikari until they finally met on the stage. Mm -hmm. It was cute. It was sad. But it was it was fun. And it it made the impact of the of the show 
much better. Yeah. I think it does well to contextualize, too, why Karen is allowed to be separate from everybody else while all this is going on. Um, Mm -hmm. Because Karen is more intimate with separation than the rest of them are. Um, Like... I think like the the part where they're they're in middle school and you know she's eating with her friends at a fast food place and then as you mentioned she goes off to her voice lessons um like that that's when like everyone's talking about like oh she's going to aim for um I think it was Seisho right like she's going to go for this uh you know really tough to get into school um and as we're seeing that, like, you know, when she's making the application, when she's, like, looking it up and everything, um, when she's applying herself to that, there isn't this, like, hesitation or, like, you know, sort of, like, concern about what happens next when I don't get to be with my friends anymore. Um, like, that, that breaking point that happens with the rest of the crew, um, doesn't exactly apply to Karin, um because she's kind of been so devoted to Hikari this whole time. Um, like, she's still definitely grappling with it. Um, like, the fact that Hikari is gone, and that, you know, she sort of has this dip in confidence where she's lost herself. Um, like, you know, she doesn't really even have a plan of what she's going to do after high school as a result. But it's different for her, right? Um, she already had sort of this long-standing um relationship coming in uh and and through like her whole childhood as this undercurrent um which i think helps to sort of allow the movie to take the format it does which is a lot of one-off duels (laughs) and then also the climax so many karen yeah it's it's interesting because in my thought process the the duels were to see who would challenge karen Mm mm-hmm but they weren't. They didn't even fight anyone else. Everything was one off. Yep. Because the duels were not about becoming the top star for the future. It was about accepting your potential as an individual. Yeah. And I th- I think that it did that so fucking well. Mm-hmm. Every single duel was incredible. Yeah. Um, Even when you get to the part where you're like, oh, I get it. The person who lost right. before is going to win. They still keep mixing it up on you. Yeah. Uh, do you want to just go and talk about the duels? I, I, like, one by one? <laughs> or do you think we should save that? I, I think we can do that. Like, because there's just, there's plenty there to talk about. Um, before right. we do, uh, I'll, I'll admit, like, I kind of forgot about the, the bits of backstory with Karen and Hikari. Um... Like, after I watched the movie and I'm, like, scrolling back through my brain of, like, what happened in this movie? What did I like about it? Those parts didn't really surface aside from, like, um, the the part I mentioned before. Um, right. But, like, it is a very important, like, it's kind of to, the bedrock of the movie. It's why the movie to works, me, I think. To me, it, the reason that I don't remember it nearly as much because it feels like it's always been there. Yeah. You know, you're you're not learning anything new. Right, you know all of this already happened, so it's it's more of a build up to something we already know is going to happen. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of fits like into your knowledge space of the first movie. Yeah, yeah. It, it it expanded on the first one, but it is not what you remember about the movie. Uh huh. Yeah. Give me a month, and first. I'll probably forget what was in the original series versus what was in this movie. Um, right. But I think Be- that's because that great. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk about the fights so the the first fight we do is of course uh daiba curb stomping everyone (laughs) yeah daiba curb stomps everyone i got really nervous Mm -hmm. during that part because there's a she like slits june's throat uh right and she slits juna's throat i think it was juna but anyways yeah everyone's like bleeding seemingly and and you're like oh shit is this gonna be like metaphorically dark and it turns out it's just a stage prop. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also has one of my favorite gags. There's not a lot of gags in this show, but one of my favorite gags is Karuko is like hamming up that she's like dead, and some of the fake blood gets in her mouth, and she says it's tasty. Yeah, she kind of licks it <laughs> secretly, and and I think that's fun. I think it's also fun that the actors were like, "Oh man, fake blood, gotta ham it up." Mm-hmm. It's a it's a weird part of the show. Uh, but they never do anything like that again. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so so Daiba Daiba has this thing where she says you have to you have to take your position as the person who wants to be the top star again. Are you ready to play the parts you've forgotten? Essentially saying, are you ready to try again? Mm-hmm. Are you ready to see how much you've changed in these these this past couple years? Mm-hmm. And she starts off by just slaying. The best part is that she has one sword like for half the fight, and then a train pulls up to them and it throws her her second sword, mm-hmm. and it just changes the fight. It's awesome. It's yeah. so extra, but it's so Daiba. Uh huh. Um, that's I think that's the point where you know everything's gonna be fine because <laughs> it's it's just as it's just like the original show. It's this amazing level of like absolute bullshit but it's so blunt and it's also just open for interpretation enough that like it keeps you curious but it doesn't feel like you're lost right Right. like and it's easy to separate what's rule of cool and what's supposed to be sort of like story content you know like it's like there's i don't think there's a particular meaning behind you know Daiba getting her second sword jetted to her from like the the door of a passing train other than it's cool yeah but when they start picking up tomatoes then it's like okay this is this is metaphor time let's pay attention i i do want to start out that the show begins with the giraffe with kieran running through a a desert (laughs) and he's he's talking about how he's about to miss it and then he makes it and he goes i've made it i understand and you're like, what the fuck does this mean? Mm-hmm. What does this mean, giraffe? Yeah. Uh, but it's it's basically he's you, right? He's the audience. He he's always represented the audience, but he's basically walking in to say, I hope I don't miss the movie. I didn't miss the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he he has a very not subtle uh, metaphor about him supplying the girls with life because they mm-hmm. exist to entertain the audience, right? They're theater girls, and so he is literally food. Uh, he also spontaneously combusts to fuel the auditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does. It's weird, mm-hmm. uh, but it's, you know, it's yeah. It's the kind of thing that maybe doesn't like visually when you first see it. It's like I don't get what's happening, but then when you take it very literally, that's when it makes more sense, right? It's like, oh, yeah. he's food because he's fuel. It's yeah. it's not actually that complex, right? Or it's not yeah. that far removed from what it actually really is. <laughs> it's review starlight yeah. it does that um yeah yeah it's oh it's so much <laughs> it's so much uh <laughs> and so we have we have a uh so the fights begin the auditions begin and it is essentially the rivals from the first show fighting each other mm-hmm. so it starts out with uh karuko and futaba and futaba you know, their whole thing is that Futaba has always been doing what Karuko does. And she's kind of mad that she's going to Kyoto to do the traditional thing. And Futaba wants to expand her acting career. Mm-hmm. Uh, this scene has some of the best lighting in anime I've ever seen. <laughs> like, not as good as Akira, right? Like, come on. But I Akira. know what you mean. But they, they do they they do these big neon lights with the this this truck scene. And... It's essentially like a a road gang, like a Japanese road gang, like mm-hmm. the motorcycle gangs. And they, they do a, a, which checks out because Futaba has a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. And they they drive to each other, play chicken, fall off the, the stage. And it ends up with Futaba uh, sitting on top of Karuko uh, in a very platonic way. Wow, God, he was... And they, they have this long talk about like, what are we going to do? You know, we've been, we've literally been friends our entire life and we're going to separate because we both have different dreams. And they, they do a little cry and Futaba gives Karuko her motorcycle uh, and says, don't hurt this when you go to uh, Kyoto. Uh, and then she cuts the, the strand on her cape and it's great. It's so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and it weirdly enough, not the most impactful fight of the show. Not even close. Yeah. But it's still really good because it has that 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 self driving desire as well as understanding that the reason they're both where they're at is because of each other. Mm-hmm. It's 
it's not a it's not a I did this for me. It is I did this for you and you did this for me. And we we owe it to each other to understand that. But our our stuff ends at least a little bit, you know, it's to the next stage and it might not include you. And it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um for I think for Kaduko, like it, it really is kind of it's some characterization we had not gotten before. It's not just a revisit. Um, because it's being sort of elevated, like as Daiba was setting up, like, all right, if we're going to be leaving high school and you're out in the world again and we're kind of at the bottom of the rung, what are you going to do about it? Um, mm-hmm. And in that sense, it's, it's very strong, right? Um, that both of them are kind of... Uh, they're, they're standing up for themselves. Um but they're not letting go of, like, their interests. They kind of have this back and forth where, like, the the landscape or the backdrops of the fight are changing based on their tastes. Um, You know, and they keep kind of switching lead, sort of. Um, And there is a tiger that is riding a motorcycle on one of the billboards that is... is, On on one of the trucks. It's, once again, for how subtle uh, Ravu Starlight can be, it can also be so fucking in your face <laughs> that it's awesome. Yeah. I, I think that's what makes it great, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't. It doesn't take a. It doesn't take six watches to try and get what it's saying. You might notice more stuff as you watch it, but you get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it's it, it's so in your face about it that it it, it it's kind of fun. Yeah. Hey Grant, you want to play a little game? Yeah. What's your game? Um. At. What what part of the movie do you think that fight takes place? What, do you remember? So, like, think about it in either in minutes or percentage, you know, whichever you prefer. So out of the two hours. That's, like, that's like at least 60% through the movie, right? Ding, ding. Yeah, you're correct. It's, like, it's like halfway through. I think it starts at about an hour. Um, yeah. Which is it, it's... knocking me off my block because I thought, like, again, just trying to remember what happens in this movie... I thought it was like maybe like twenty five or thirty percent way through. <laughs> well, because you gotta remember they do they do the entire setup to the the second audition. They do the fight with Daiba. They go back to the the school mm-hmm. and talk about how they need to to replay their parts so they can restore their passion as they graduate. Yeah. Right? It's a so lot more front loaded than I remember. It's so front loaded and it's awesome. It doesn't feel slow. Yeah. 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 I never felt like I was getting exposition dumped on, uh-huh. despite the fact that I absolutely was. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like the scene in Madoka where Kyoko is telling her story of her life. Right, mm-hmm. you don't realize how long that is until like you watch it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's good. It's good, and that fight starts, and it's great. Uh, and then the next fight is that the Mahiru Hakari fight. Mm-hmm. That fight is sad. It's it's one of those things where Mahiru has always been a, a second wheel to Hikari, right? And she never really felt that Karin appreciated her friendship. And it's true. Third wheel? What? Third wheel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. What I said. I think you said second wheel. Oh yeah, no, third wheel. <laughs> second I mean, banana, third a, wheel. <laughs> unless they're a fucking uh unicycle. But, um, <laughs> yeah, the third wheel. That's kind of in line with the movie's <laughs> themes. <laughs> That's true. Everyone has a unicycle. What you do with it is up to you. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, it's a little strange. I wasn't really feeling this fight for the longest time because Mahiru's playing this incredibly edgy and, uh, like, you took her from me kind of character and is, like, very mean. Uh, but the entire purpose was to show Hikari that she was stronger and a much better actor than what she gave her credit for. <laughs> uh, it's a little odd. I I agree. It's a little weird. Um, but I I love the hell out of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I I liked it after it finished. I I I think I liked it all the way through. Um, well, then you talk about it. okay. Uh. I, I, for one, it's a nice contrast compared to uh, Futaba and uh, Karuko's song, which, as Grant mentioned, like, is very, like, it's very backlit, right? There's a lot of low lighting. Um, so, like, when they're doing, like, their uh, sort of, like, 
almost like noir set up at one point, you know, like it's a lot oh, of like yeah, the... murky greens and and pur- pink and purple, I think, you know, like I forgot about that part in uh-huh. the Futaba and Karuko part. Yeah. That part's sick. The lighting is like, like it's very sultry or it's very stark and it's usually like either casting around the characters or it's behind them. Um, I think we should mention that there's a ton of costume changes in their fight scenes. Yes. And all of them. Yes. Absolutely. There there are different there are different scenes, there are different genres they're playing. I forgot about that because Mahiru and Hikari have the Olympic themes going on where they keep changing into different uh like sports outfits. Yeah, yeah. Um I think what like Ma- Mahiru's like initial part of the fight i think is just a nice callback to her her first one where it's like oh it's fun and games right like this is all just a it's just a little event we're taking place in um and all the lighting is very like flat right it's like it's almost like it's supposed to be like sunlit um which again is like it's very uninteresting compared to the fight before it um but then the the fight goes through a whole tonal shift where all the instrumentation drops out and Mahiru is singing it a cappella. Um, and that, it's just like, that's like chill up my spine kind of stuff. And they, they start adding the instrumentation back in and it's a lot more like, there's a lot more trepidation, you know? And like it, the, it's not that like, it's not that sort of like whimsical theming anymore. Instead, it's this like foreboding or like almost sinister kind of thing going on um for for mahiru to then sort of turn it around at the end and be like yeah check it out i have range um i think that's a nice thing for her um and i i like that it's paired with hikari because it shows just how much she's off guard it's it's not that i think that mahiru sort of is like actually secretly a better actor than Hikari. Um, you know, I I think it's that it, it it demonstrates like how little Hikari's been paying attention to everyone else, um, and is sort of like a, a wake up call in that sense. Um, right. I guess if you wanted to, you could also extrapolate that like, hey, if Mahiru can do this, then what could Karin be doing? Um, you know, it's sort of like you know, measuring them up. Um, but in any case, I think it's, I think it's, uh, a nice leap for Mahiru's character. Um, and it gives, uh, Hikari sort of like, uh, an arc back in the movie. You know, it's like, Hey, while you've been away, we've all been skilling up. So don't go easy on us, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's something within that resonated with me pretty strongly. Um, it it definitely stuck with me pretty hard. So, yes, I agree, and it's good, and it's it's incredible, and it makes so much. It it really helps uh, Mahiru's character, who I thought was probably the weakest character in uh, the original the original show, um, and I thought they did such a fantastic job at representing her. <laughs> um. Do you have anything else to say about that? Nope. Before we move I, th- on I think to... I've said pretty much everything I want to say about like the events of that fight. And so we have the Daiba Nana versus the Juna, the Juna fight, which is such a good fight. <laughs> I was crying at the end of it. Yeah. It, it's it's you know it's interesting because you have these characters who understand each other, but Juna never surpassed Daiba ever in the original series. They understood each other, but they understood each other as Daiba is the strong one and Juna's the weak one. Mm-hmm. And um, they're also, I'd say, you know, the most outside of the, the acting part of this, right? Like Daiba is, you know, projecting that she's pretty comfortable not being an actor first and foremost. And so is Juna, you know, they're both kind of running mm-hmm. away from the stage. Um, and so I think it's fitting that they have to sort of wrestle with those emotions together. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's not so much that like um that it it's it's not a case where one of them is saying 
hey, you're better than this. Let's get you on your feet. It's both of them kind of calling each other out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, kind of like maybe finding common ground there. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you have Daiba just absolutely crushing, uh, Juna at the beginning. She, she kicks her ass in almost every, every part. And she even, uh, breaks her weapon. She even, she breaks her weapon and she does the whole, um, she does the whole, uh, like, y all you do is repeat philosophers. You, you, you're nothing. And we know that she's done it in the past. Um, and then she, Daiba gives her her katana and basically says, cut your own string. Uh, you lost. Um, and she doesn't, she uses the, the, the katana to, she stabs it into the crystal of her, of her, of her, her bow and then fights Daiba again. And she, she does a really great job. And, uh, when, when during this entire time, uh Daiba's basically saying you were sparkling but you've lost that sparkle and so this entire time June is like why'd you have to say it in the past tense and she's like you're, you're not passionate anymore and then uh she's uh the the part where she she puts the thing in and she says uh uh try and see if you can kill me uh die banana mm -hmm. uh and then they fight that part slaps because mm -hmm. they they all have these big uh these these big uh quotes when they're when they're introducing herself and and juna doesn't do it until later uh and when when she beats uh nana uh for like the first time they 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 like walk away and you hear Daiba say she is sparkling. Wow, God, and it's so fucking good. Yeah. And again, low on subtlety. Like they're they're literally walking away from each other on a gigantic T strip as position zero, you know? Like <laughs> but Right. Who needs subtlety? Um Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think that and, and of course Juna gets the fucking best song. She has the best song in the original show and she has the best song in the movie Fight Me. Um, I'm, I just might, uh, <laughs> but uh, and I say that as a as a big Juna fan, you know. Um, but I I absolutely love their fight. Um, may, maybe I really just didn't think about it enough the first time, but like sort sort of illuminating that Juna's using a bow because she's not using things that she created herself you know she's not sort of an improv actor in that sense you know she's just by the book um it's like oof that's something that you know really i don't think was touched on very well in, in the original series just another thing that sort of goes to show that as well as they wrap things up the first time they still had even more to talk about since then um yeah you know it's a very dynamic fight um, you know, when they set things up with defenses at first, you know, and they're, and they're weaving through that and, and whatever, like, I, I think this fight might have some of the strongest dialogue, um, like where their banter between each other is like, you know, very, very interesting. I think it, it perhaps says more about them than the other fights do. Um, I, I guess it's also a decent time to mention uh, we did not have a, a really great opportunity to to keep up with all the lyrics along with the the subtitles. I think I mostly paid attention to the the spoken dialogue and then you know the subtitles didn't uh, for the the lyrics didn't stick as well with me, which is probably a shame because I know like all of it's meaningful. Um, so if there's stuff that we're missing as a result, it's because we you know we had the chance to watch it once and we haven't you know gone back and watched it again, but yeah. Um, oh, okay, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of brushing back through this. 
um uh and i'm i the part at the end when they show like the um like the shallow pond and they have all the photos and the camera submerged in it oh <laughs> yeah that's so good Sad. uh so next we do uh oh jesus Sorry. What? I forgot the part where uh Diva says she's dazzling. She starts crying there for like a yeah, little, no. little moment. God damn it. It's it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Um and then we have the Maya Claudine fight, which is an entire act. <laughs> like it is an entire play. It has a prologue, it has like five acts. It's short. But it starts with them creating a a, a contract for their fight. Um, and it's incredible. Uh, you have so they they're they're playing out different characters of this fight, and it ends with Maya cutting Claudine's uh, cape and then knocking her down. She's like, "I won." And then Claudine laughs and she's like, "You didn't win. You're, you're you 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 signed the contract. You have to keep fighting me." Um, and it's really funny because that entire scene is this just them saying, basically, this is what the audience wants. They want to see us fight, so let's make it flashy. <laughs> and it is it is so well animated. It is so good. They have great, great, like, camera turns. The, the emotions are good. There's so much fun movement. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it, it, it's like... From what I understand about Review Starlight fans and their feelings about uh, Claudine and Maya, I don't know of anybody who would be disappointed watching this fight. Um, just an absurd amount of, let's say, energy <laughs> between these yeah. girl friends. Wow, God, Not stated in text, but goddamn. Like, <laughs> if, there, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of... I would I would say lesbian love in this in this series and in this movie um they don't really ever say it out loud but like if you're looking for for one place for for hard evidence I feel like this fight is um plenty for you there and and if you go to like the Ravi Starlight subreddit it is like 90% Maya and Claudine fan art mm -hmm. like that's not even that's not even a an exaggeration yeah it's fun to be able to see these characters who normally sort of represent the like the prestige tier of acting you know um or sort of the battle up against that um i think it's great that they use that and turn it on its head by making this like a the the equivalent of like teleports behind you you know <laughs> it's primal it's primal they're they're like tricking each other and shit like the part where claudine like produces another badge on her tongue is just the one of the slickest <laughs> things the entire movie has to offer so extra it's so funny um and it's nice to sort of see things unwind like that right it's not this like stiff competition between them anymore like where it's just like i'm better than you it's like you know they actually have a dynamic going um right you know before i think they were kind of like they they didn't get as much of that expressive quality to their their roles in the show they were kind of the the main bosses of the show you know they have the the <laughs> two on two duel at the end of the original series um and so that's kind of what they represent, right? They are um, the strongest actors, um, but that's it. Just you know, they it, it almost kind of comes off as they're the strongest actors in like strictly ability, right? They're jumping the highest. They're the most flexible. They're uh, you know the best at enunciation, and you know they can. Uh, they're they're like songs are very like classical and stuff like that right it's the it's the traditional peak of what you know the image of the actor is um mm -hmm. but here they get to have way more fun with it and break it out um all of claudine's efforts to sort of like trip maya up um and test her ability to to be flexible 
um, I think just like it, it makes me like those characters so much more than I already did. So, congrats to them. Yes, I agree. I hope they have a beautiful wedding. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's interesting about that fight is it's technically the climactic fight of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the next the next fight is the the Karin and uh, Hikari fight. So Hikari does lose to Mahiru, but it's not since it's not the traditional audition. She's like, you get to go see Karin. That is why you're here, and so she does. Um, and they they end up on top of the Tokyo Tower, and. They they talk about their their passions and what they want, and when Karin comes to the realization that she no longer has her next stage, right? Her next stage had always been Hikari, and she dies. Yeah, like she dies. Like yeah, all pretty much everybody in this, uh, in this whole stage show dies at least once. Like they have their yeah. sort of death slash ego death um and then they eat and then they eat a tomato yeah uh and so they they she dies <laughs> and uh they do the whole i will be reborn thing from the the first one mm-hmm. oh god and they do it <laughs> By turning her into a metal version of position zero. Yeah, they like stage marking. They like coffin closer oh, in it. Hold hold on, yeah. hold on. I gotta I gotta mention something from the Maya Claudine fight. Oh yeah. When 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 Maya thinks that she's beaten Claudine and she goes to, to take position zero and it fucking closes on her. Yep. The part fucking rules. Uh-huh. And they and and then they, when they when they're done, I forgot to mention this part, and when they're done and they're like sitting next to each other, like laying on the floor. And they basically say, we are going to fight like this forever, right? They basically look at each other and realize that they're going to probably compete for roles in the future, and this is just who they are as people, mm-hmm. and they, they both love it, right? Yeah. They're, they're both, they're, they both realize that they're not, they might not be going to the same actor troupe, but they're going to run into each other here, and they're ready for mm-hmm. it. I love that part. Yeah. That part rules. I'm really glad that those two get to fight with uh, Karoku and Futaba about uh, who has the gayest part of this entire movie. <laughs> um, in our line of work, we don't get to, to have that kind of competition this often. Uh, so the fact that it's not just like, oh, we got to see a gay part, you know, but it's like, oh, there's multiple, and and who can do it most? Um, that's great. Um the the metal shutters closing over the position zero is so dumb and I love it. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. It's it's so in line with that whole fight. There's just like Yeah. The it's it's them like, you know, you didn't win, I have I'm invincible. I'm a vampire. You can't kill me. You need a wooden stake. Okay, well I have a wooden stake and I'm gonna use it right now. Well actually, uh I have a fire shield and so that burns your wooden stake. You know, it's just like <laughs> It's so stupid. Yeah. It rules. It fucking rules. Uh so Karin dies, and they turn her into a metal version of Position Zero. They put her on the train, uh, and then the, the the transformation scene music from the first one plays, uh, and it's all like it's all like steamy and industrial. And then she launches up to the Tokyo Tower, and the the metal opens up, and she comes out, and she's been reborn again because you know, mm-hmm. Revu Starlight. Um, her, her sword breaks because Hikari is basically saying like, Hey, I love you. Uh, but we need to do what we both want to do right now. Uh, and so her sword breaks to be the same size as Hikari's dagger. Um, and then Hikari cuts position zero into Karin's shirt (laughs) and places it there and Karin explodes into a bunch of position zeros. The Tokyo Tower <laughs> rockets into space. <laughs> and then it crashes down on a big position zero tape in the middle of a fucking desert. 
and all the girls uh, removed their capes as they watched this because they're no longer auditioning against each other. Uh, and Karin comes out, and her and Hikari are like, we'll see you on the next stage. And then it ends. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember when we got to the part, and we're like, there's only five minutes left? Yeah, yeah. What the fuck are they going to do? Uh-huh. And... It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I I I went and like d- and during the part before Hakari and Karin fight, Karin and Hakari, I mean uh yeah, Karin and Hakari look at the fucking camera and are like, "Are we supposed to fight?" And it's like, "That's what they want us to do." And you're like, "Fuck off. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. I'm not talking to an anime girl through my TV. Shut the fuck up." Yeah. Yeah. Um But I'm like, "Yes, I want to see you fight." <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I do have to amend my my earlier statement. Um Hikari cutting position zero into Karn is also in the running for gayest thing that happens in this movie. Um, <laughs> to, to be like, hey, you, you're my stage, right? Like, right, right. You're my position zero. You're my comfort. You're where I start, right? You are where I start and where I end. Fuck. <laughs> it's it's so it's so in your face, it's right? Peter kid but, version of like I'm in your heart. Right, like we're on right. we're on Kingdom Hearts levels of like metaphor and analogy, in and I mean that in the in the nicest happiest way possible. <laughs> it's great that that happens, and I like it so much. <sighs> and then they have epilogues to the epilogue, um, whereas they play the credits, they get to tell you where everybody went. Yeah, and everyone everyone did what they wanted to do. Uh. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to go through what happens? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So credits are rolling, and Hikari is basically traveling around. Uh, we get to see some of the minor characters recognize. Oh, you know, Hikari's. Who is that person? And we know who it is. Um, yeah. Karoku gets uh, you know, named the the twelfth generation member of her you know traditional stuff. Uh, we've already kind of mentioned like this was her her trajectory. Um, so that worked out. Uh, you get to see her waiting with, uh, Futaba's bike, uh, which she promised to keep watch. Uh, and she knocks it over. It's very funny. Yeah. Um, and these, these are all happening essentially while the credits are rolling and you're getting them in stills, basically. Um, she's, she asks, uh, Hikari to not tell Futaba, which is cute. Next up, Hikari gets to see that Futaba, Mahiru, and Maya all joined the new National First Theater troupe, which was kind of what I think most of the movies centered on, right? Wait, yeah, wait, who did, who is Futaba, Maya, and who? Mahiru. Mahiru, that's right, that's right. Yep. It's cute. Um, And so she visits them while they're doing some, I think, singing practice, maybe, that or line reading. And then they say, "Stay tuned for our first play." Uh, so, which is cute. Yeah, they're all working together on the on the same play, which is nice. Um, Hikari goes to France and meets Claudine, who's uh, working as a waitress, but she's also joined uh, the troupe uh, Théâtre du Flamme, which it makes sense because most actors are waiters and waitresses yeah. when they're not acting. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And then uh, she says, "Next time I'll go visit you," which is cute. Juna's studying abroad at. Uh, New York Musical and Drama Academy. Yeah, because she wanted to do like the the theory, like theater theory and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. So she Which said it's, it's a stage of firsts, but I'm having fun right now. And so they have lunch together. We then move on to uh, Dai Banana, uh, my anime list's favorite character from, <laughs> from the show, show by a landslide. Um, Huge. Everyone loves Daiba. <laughs> Uh, she's studying abroad at the Royal Academy of Theatrical Actors in London. And so she's on a bench, she's reading a book. She she sort of gets to hear from Hikari that she's been going and seeing everybody. And then Hikari goes to see Karin, right? Yeah. Uh, essentially, like, there's, there's two little star shapes up in the corner of the credits that have just been sitting there. And they start to, like, close in together towards the center of the screen. You get to see a text conversation where Karin messages, sorry, I have an audition today. Uh, and Hikari sends, get out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's got like a, uh, a little like 
like a line sticker sort of with a uh, like a teddy bear face with a uh, like a razor bladed knife um, or like a serrated knife. It's it's great. Um, That's cute. Yeah, and, and then, then and then Karin like goes up to do her her uh, her thing. Ah, fuck, man. I I love that they we get a little bit of uh, a happy ending regarding like what they all did. Mm-hmm. I'm glad they all made it in such a in such a hard to break through world Mm -hmm. yep and the movie ends with the line we are already on the stage just to seal the deal with what happened with uh karen and hikari at the end of the movie and the position zero and everything like that ah god and revu starlight the movie do you want to hear a little fun fact about revu starlight the movie tell me a fun fact about revu starlight the movie well you see revu starlight the movie is has a score of 8.55, which is incredible on my anime list. Mm-hmm. And according to my anime list, it is also in the top 100 anime of all time. Congrats. It is 90th in the top 100 anime, beating beating shows like Puelo Magi Madoka Magica and Puelo Magi Madoka Magica 3, The Rebellion. That's impressive. And uh, beating, beating Perfect Blue. And... Uh, other shows yeah it of course has the advantage of being a movie so that means that right. people who liked the original series will then go watch the movie and probably no one else will do that however um the the real important thing is that it is only one it is 90 and neon genesis evangelion the end of Ava is 89 so fight i fight, think that fight. <laughs> i think that people need to start negatively reviewing neon genesis evangelion the movie but it is funny because revu starlight only has eleven thousand reviews and evangelion the end of ava has fucking eight hundred and ten thousand. yeah yeah so like yeah it's not nearly it, it's interesting because you you look at like all the other ones, and they all have like hundreds of thousands of people that have reviewed and watched it. While Rebu Starlight only has eleven thousand, so it, it's it's definitely one of those things where more people voted it high, and there's not that many people. Mm-hmm. But I do think it is funny. And in fact, I think it might be the least reviewed anime for its position. in the top one hundred. In the top one hundred, yeah, it's it's. Would you call that a cult classic then? It's absolutely a cult classic, right? It is very, very highly rated. People love it, but not a lot of people watched it. Mm-hmm. So the people who are into it are into it. You know? It's, oh, they're fucking it's like, into this it. This is they're exactly so into it. What I wanted. It is. It is exactly what I wanted, and I would say that the movie. I I don't know if it would be better than the show, but I don't think it's worse. I I feel like they mm-hmm. just complement each other so well that I cannot look at them as separate things. That's a really good way to put it. I I like that more than what I thought about framing the movie as. So I'm going to just adopt what, that into my reality now. What were you going to frame the movie as? Just out of complete curiosity. Um well just that like it's it's more of the show, you know, that but like right. but in the sense that it's like a distinct epilogue. Um it's one of those things where like it's it's hard to say that like say the songs in this movie beat any of the songs from the original series for me well no definitely some beat some of them but like the best song out of this movie or my favorite song out of this movie is not my favorite song over something from the original series however um like they they stand so even right like it really honestly feels like they didn't miss a beat from point a to point b um and there are times where I think like, oh, I don't know if it if it really has the substance or the, you know, the depth to really kind of like make it like, you know, s- something that's worth singing these praises. Maybe it's just maybe I just vibe with it and maybe it's not that great. But like, no, I, I remember feeling the same way about the original Raving Starlight and it's continued to not falter in my mind at all. Right. If there's been any kind of like objective measurement of you know what i feel about these shows um it's been a while like a long time since our original review starlight watch and i don't feel any less about it 
like the fact that I still have these moments where it's like, oh, I should show more people this show. Um, I feel like that's proof enough, right? It has that evergreen quality, like, you know, the other dime a dozen, like Cowboy Bebop and, you know, these things we can just kind of throw in anytime. Ravie Starlight's up there. So I have to always give it that credit, right? Just because it makes it look easy, um, doesn't mean it doesn't deserve like those accolades that like fan response. 100%. What is your favorite song from the movie? <clears throat> um, this has been tough. Uh, cuz I've I've been re-listening to the insert songs uh like yesterday and today. Uh I think it's Mahiru's um which was uh Metal Sizdal Panic. Um like tight name. It's I think it has like it's got all like it's got fun and it's got tension and it's it's got chills like it it has like a really strong emotional range um and again like just the the part where like you know all the instrumentation is pulled away and like there's a severe echo on everything like like it's one of those things that just automatically gives me chills um so that's great but widescreen baroque is also really great. Um, oh fuck yeah, Why wide's I for so it's interesting because it's what widescreen. It's like uh, widescreen wild screen. Yeah, that's the yeah because yeah yeah it is really good and that one that one is sang through like almost the entire thing. They sing that a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a recurring part of the movie. It's a, it's a, oh shit, I studied this motif. Yeah, yeah, no? it's a, a light oh. motif. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I think if there's one thing that's slightly weaker to me about uh, Wild Screen Baroque is that um, the the instrumentation used for it has kind of that, no, this is where I don't, like, I'm not going to use the right terms for this, but um it's it sounds kind of like sort of an indian or maybe like west asian north african kind of like instruments being used um to go with like the the starlight theming right like starlight as in inside the show starlight where they have kind Mm -hmm. of that um they have like the desert imagery and stuff like that um but the first time it plays there's very little attachment to Starlight, right? They're just, like, on the train. And so it it maybe feels a little, like, out of place um, that they have, like, that, like, theming and style of music um, in what's mostly, like, a pretty industrial-looking, like, metallic uh, fight scene. So, like, the most minimal of possible complaints. Um right. But yeah, like it's it's such a solid tone setter for the movie. Um, and I all like I forget how late in the movie it kind of happens, but like when it goes, it goes, and then everything carries from there. Dope, good answer. What about um, you? you I, was it uh, Futaba and Kaoruku's song for you? Ju- no, it was Juna and oh, Dibana that's right, song. that's right. Fucking love that song. I don't know what it's called, but it's great. <laughs> Um. So yeah. Yeah. All the songs are great in this movie. They're really good. I kept good shit. I kept thinking like, oh, I'll go listen to my favorites again, but I'd forget to to go and like click back on on one of them earlier in the playlist, and it would just go all the way through. And it's just like, yeah, this is fine. I I like all <laughs> these just as much. Um, let it run. Um. Hey, I have a question for you then. Um. Uh, what parts of this movie made you cry? Do you remember? Oh, uh, like. Uh, she is sparkling. Made me cry. Yeah. Um, the part where Hikari was afraid that Karin died. Um, I I loved. I didn't cry necessarily, but I loved when they all did the like their uh their introduction, where it's like with the light reborn in my heart, my new flesh and blood seeks life to sing, dance, and battle. If those are our wild instincts, then from the 99th class, Hikari Kagura, fate changes, so does the stage. Like, mm-hmm. all of that shit, I'm just like, fuck yeah, let's go, let's go. Yeah. Like, got got real, real into it. And they also have, like, the different, the different, like, uh, ah, that shit rules. I loved uh the part where Futaba... Uh, and 
Karuka kind of just like stare at each other for a ton. <laughs> uh, like like it's it uh, the 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 part where they're yelling at each other on the trucks was really cool. <laughs> oh man, what about you? Um, I I think like okay, uh, Kenjiro Suda once again is like like manages to be in both an underdog and kind of like a show stealer at the same time uh in his performance as Kirin um like he doesn't he doesn't do a whole lot in this movie but he makes use of every second he has um in the original series he has to be sort of subdued for most of it right like lots of low slow speech um but for him to to start off and sort of like be belting about how he wants to make it in time for the show you know and like you know last time he we ended on him saying he doesn't understand but now he's back to saying i understand like it's like oh my god he is very moving like just as much as as i think the rest of the actresses you know like yeah yeah uh I really like the for every hero there are trials, for every saint there are temptations, for me there's you. <laughs> Which is also in the running for the gayest thing that yep. happens in the show. Uh-huh. Um, you know, like, I, I didn't cry at this, but the psychedelic shots of Kirin being food. like the, Oh, that part was wild. Yeah, like, it, like I mean, caution for, like, the flashing imagery and everything, but my god, like, like you know, like some horror tinge in there just to kind of like just keep you on your toes um let's see daiba kind of heartlessly cutting juna's badge off that hurt i think i I think i definitely got choked up at that let's see and then i guess lastly uh when the 101st class is getting their stuff set up they're kind of having their pep rally oh that part's really cute when they bring the tower up and they get it yeah and it's like lit up and everything it's the starlight tower i just some for whatever reason that that like was instant cry material for me oh that was good i i I didn't really cry at this part but one of the one of the the parts that made me like like shit like shiver (laughs) was when uh they were looking at the corpses and quotes of themselves before they re-entered the audition oh god yeah and they're like all like hanging around them in different ways, um, or the part where um, the the they're on the they're on the the train and the the notification plays for the audition, and then the the circle rolls down, and then all their their outfits appear in front of them. That part fucking rules. Mm-hmm. Ah man, oh man, so much good stuff in this movie. So much good stuff. Uh, all right. Themes? Themes. Themes. We've already talked a lot about themes, so, um, stuff that we haven't mentioned yet, um, ma- mainly the tomato. Tomato shows up a lot in this movie. Um, everybody's got a tomato. Uh, you bite into it and it gives you, uh, an immortality. And that's the theme. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I do think they use it well. And I, this is going to be my reading of what the tomato is. It's not like it feels obvious what the tomato is meant to represent, but right? it's like, oh yeah, totally, totally. But then again, I could I could see myself misinterpreting this somehow. Uh, but it feels to me like like the tomato is playing a couple roles. Like the tomato is your food, right? It's your fuel. It's Kieran being like, "Hey, I made a vegetables. Eat me." And and my my reception to your performance, and it makes you able to do more of that, right? Um, so literally, the tomato is the fuel, right? Um, it's it's especially good at that compared to say all the other vegetables that Kieran will sometimes be made of, um, because it's you know it's a really soft fruit. It's got a thin membrane. There's no really distinctly inedible parts to it. It's not difficult to eat, right? Um, like, I mean, I don't on the daily go and like just take a bite out of tomato, but some people do, including in this movie, right? Um, and so it, it also works in that it's kind of unappealing to do that, right? Like, just taking a bite out of a tomato, it's 
you know, it resembles flesh clearly, right? It's it's red, it's it's gushy, right? It's it's kind of, you know, unless you do this a lot, it's kind of gross, right? Even if it's not visually gross to you, it's going to, you know, get everywhere. Um and so, you know, there is this kind of like contrast there, right? Um it's easy nourishment but there's like a psychological or emotional barrier there. Um, for the audience to use the tomato as a tool of critique, right? Um, it, it becomes a special kind of insult, right? For your tomato to just be destroyed. Um, you're wasting food, you're staining an actor or the set. Um, you know, it's it's the audience's moment to take this thing of gratitude um, and and use it not for that. Um, and so there becomes this, you know, once again, a, a difference in the relationship with the tomato, right? In a way, the tomato doesn't feel like it's yours. Um, so for the actors to take the tomato and, uh, to eat it, right? To eat their own tomato. Um, it is this, this act of acceptance, you know, that like, um, you know, this is my nourishment from the audience, right? Uh, this has been produced and given to me. Um, it belongs to me in a way. It's something that I've always identified in myself and I have to eat it to keep on going. Um, even if in some ways it's unpleasant, uh, whether to think about or, or to, you know, consume. And so, you know, these two things together, the nourishment and the fear kind of become one complete unit in survival as an actor. Um, there is like a, a part of this reading that I might not be a hundred percent in love with because like th there's times in this movie, I think that feel a little bit, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstrapsy. Um, you know, like, oh, well, you know, everyone's got, everyone's got to eat your tomato. You know, uh, the audience gives you reception and you got to take it. You have to harden yourself against it and you have to go and you have to keep failing and failing or succeeding and succeeding and, ex and just expect that expectations are going to be there, right? We're all going to work our best and we're never going to give up and it's going to be hard. And that's, you know, not, not always a great mindset, you know, at least in my life, that's been quite a bit of baggage. And I've seen it kind of like really, um, really hurt people who are like that passionate about their art, what they do. But I, I don't feel like that's what Ravy Starlight's trying to say either. Um, I feel like when they have Kieran in vegetable medley form, um, and they show him like falling and burning, um, I, I, to me, that represents that some critique will be made to waste, and there is an abundance of critique, right? That's why they're eating their own tomatoes, right? No one in the movie eats from Kieran, you know, no one goes and like takes a part of him and eats it. It's always their own tomato that they're consuming. Um, and so I think that kind of makes it more about acceptance of the self from within the self rather than just being like an audience is all the actor is kind of relationship. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you get all that? Yeah. Yeah, I got all that. Okay. I got all that. Does any of that make any kind of sense or meaning? Yeah, no, it does. Okay. I'll listen to it again, and I'll probably be like, oh, yeah, now I get it a little bit better. <laughs> uh, I think in that case, I didn't do a good job. <laughs> no, but, no. No, but, um, for real. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's accepting yourself. There's a little bit of ego death in there. Um, it's about, you know, taking the, the good and the bad um, and and just getting by. You know, and, and yeah. not losing, not losing what you got, remembering what you have inside you. You're always on stage. Yeah. You always have a tomato. It's that easy. Why don't millennials get this grant? <laughs> don't spend money on avocado toast. Just find your tomato and eat tomato. it. Tomato. Eat your soul tomato. I mean, it could also be like. You know, the tomato represents your own ambition and your own passion, and so you gotta accept that you have that mm -hmm. and work with it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, 
what's our what's our I don't have any more themes. I kind of talked about them while we were Yeah, we've kind of talking about the fights. Yeah. We we've already spoken plenty about thematics. Um so hypotheticals. Let's have some fun. Um Grant, let's say that you're on board for this movie's development, right? The movie has not come out yet. It's being made. Um, and the production's potentially going to run too far in the red unless uh, you put aside uh, your strong leftist ideals and you pitch a product placement deal. Okay? Okay. What do you put into the movie that's going to get you your yen mm-hmm. without destroying the quality of the movie hmm. well seeing as how popular guilty gear came <laughs> with with bridget being canonically trans i don't think i need to really uh like ruin my morals i can just introduce <laughs> a, a trans character and make them a, a trans icon on twitter and people will go and watch it no but i mean you have to, like where's the where's the product placement part of that though you have to oh, oh, are you saying I have to add a product? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Okay. okay. So like I mean if you want to be like, hey, I've made a new Vocaloid and it's unique to and uh Ravy Starlight and she's trans and that's awesome and now go buy this and get a Yamaha keyboard, then like that's that could be something, but <laughs> I would um I would have <laughs> <laughs> okay okay you know when the fucking train comes and it gives uh it gives daiba her katana yeah <laughs> the katana she'd be like ah, oh, yes the katana from gibiate <laughs> <laughs> she like names off the like the artisan who created it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and she says oh man i'm so glad that i get to use this cool katana from the series gibiate and then the rest of the movie is normal <laughs> hey, do you want to know something funny I considered that exact same answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, product placement, product placement, katana? Chibiate. K- Chibiate katana. I'm so glad we both, we, we both arrived at the same <coughs> exact place. <laughs> or, or I would have it so that they would, when they go to the Tokyo Tower, like, I, it would just be like a tourist thing for Japan. Where it's like, oh yes, the Tokyo Tower, a magnificent place to visit when you're in Japan. <laughs> just every time, every time they mention Tokyo Tower, just be like, oh yes, the Tokyo Tower, a wonderful place to bring your fa- friends and family uh-huh. when you visit Japan. Yeah, just like a real recording of a tour that's just playing in the background. Yes, hundred yeah. percent. I could say that, see them doing something where like they get some real actual stage production that would have been running when the movie was released. And they put posters up for it or something. And so everyone's like, oh, wow, that was so cool. I want to get into theater. And they're like, hey, look, I saw posters for this in the movie. That must mean that they like, oh, yes. like it improved Hamilton. it. Hamilton. No. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would strike you deep. We're moving on to the next hypothetical in the last one. Okay. Okay. Um, so we, we mentioned this a little before in the review that – the all the duels are just like one on ones, right? They're kind of grudge matches. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so aside from you know Daiba kind of wiping everyone else out at the beginning, if this were to play out round robin style again with like everyone's kind of new step up to the plate attitude, um, do you think the results would be the same? Do you think there'd be shakeups? Like, would there be any I, any character duels that, like, you know, are, are, like, noticeably significant or interesting? What would you, like, dream matches, etc. What do you think? Hikari, Hikari versus Maya would be really cool. <laughs> oh, you're right. Um, Because they, they did not fight. They fought as a duo in the, the show, but I think just straight up Hikari versus Maya would be dope. <laughs> um, I would also like to see Juno versus Claudine. Post post beating Daiba, so it'd be sort of a, a. I didn't expect to see you here. Mm-hmm. Um. I I think I would like to see Mahiru fight Daiba as well, because I think that would have been neat. Because because da- Mahiru was the one that got her ass kicked over and over again in the show, <laughs> but it would be neat to see her actually stand a chance against Daiba. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't have anything more to say about Raven Starlight, the movie, except it's incredible. Yeah. I I can't believe they managed to do it. Um, Go watch it. Go watch the series first, then watch the movie if you haven't already. And if you have, this is your sign to do it again. Um, mm-hmm. Our next thing we're going to be covering, I believe, is Danganronpa V3, right? Maybe. That, that one's my white whale. <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, typically those, uh, those episodes tend to be long because they're long games. And also I like to do a lot of editing with them. Uh, and I have no, even if we record it next, I'm not sure if it would be like the next thing that's ready. So, um, just in case that doesn't happen next, um, we have a couple other things that are in the works. We have yeah. Tokyo Mew Mew New is currently running. Yure Deco and Lee Chorus Recoil. Are, all those shows are things that are running right now, and we actually are enjoying and watching along with them. Um, to yeah, we are, we are. Yeah, so so it's going to be one of those things. I, I if, if things go perfectly uh, according to plan, we'd, we will do Danganronpa V3 before we do... Uh, before Lycoris and then Tokyo Mew Mew New and Yuri Deco finish, because we'll we'll do all three of those, mm-hmm. and it's gonna be a it's gonna be a full thing. Yep. Um, not a, not in one episode, but we'll do three separate episodes. Um, and yeah. So thank you so very much for listening to us gush about this movie. If you liked what you listened to, you can follow us on YouTube. You can watch our Twitch vods if you're not watching us on Twitch live. We are currently playing through. AI, the Somnium Files, the Nirvana Initiative, is our first time playing through it. We played the first one. Uh, the last episode we posted, I forgot to turn on my mic, so eh, <laughs> 45 minutes without talking to me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, where I tweet mostly about Guilty Gear. Uh, or you don't need to do any of that, because we are not your dads. <laughs> <laughs>